you for the opportunity to provide comments on behalf of the John Muir Chapter of the Sierra Club. My name is Will Stahl and I'm Conservation Chair for the John Muir Chapter. The John Muir Chapter represents over 15,000 members and supporters living throughout the state. We work to provide opportunities for Wisconsinites to enjoy nature and to advocate for the fair and rational management of our common resources so that all Wisconsin residents have access to clean air, water, land, wild animals, and plants they need for their health and enjoyment, as well as the resources required to move our economy forward. Water is essential to Wisconsin's identity. It supports our economy, recreation, and daily needs. It is a resource that must be protected and managed carefully to ensure the health of Wisconsin's citizens and their environment. Yet, when we look around the state, we see a dead zone in Green Bay due to excessive phosphorus and other nutrients. Beaches regularly closed due to high bacteria levels. Cuts in the scientific staff of the DNR. Public water supplies with coliform bacteria. Public water utilities that no longer disinfect their water. Spills from concentrated animal feeding operations that pollute streams and rivers. Algae blooms in surface waters due to excessive phosph phosphorus. Skyrocketing numbers of impaired waterways. The Department of Natural Resources in 2016 added 225 waters to the list of impaired waterways and removed only 10. The list now includes nearly 1,300 water bodies in the state that fail to meet water quality standards mostly due to excess phosphorus. These result in real public health and economic harm and they are not chance occurrences. These Effects are the result of inadequate implementation and enforcement of the Clean Water and Safe Drinking Waters Acts. All this is well documented in the announced cuts to staffing levels of the DNR, the Legislative Audit Bureau Report of June 2016, the October 2015 Petition for Corrective Action filed by Midwest Environmental Advocates and 16 Citizens, and the Attorney General's interpretation of Wisconsin stat statute 227.10. Uh, the labs, the LAB uh, report, uh, report on DNR's implementation of the Wisconsin Pollution Discharge Elimination System under the Clean Water Act points to lack of staff, high turnover of staff, lack of enforcement, and lack of adequate inspections, among other concerns. The PCA enumerates dozens of flaws in the DNR's uh, implementation of the Clean Water Act that must be addressed. These include issuing permits lacking adequate phosphorus and mercury limits, permits that do not protect downstream users, and others that do not sufficiently protect the health of citizens and their water. Finally, the Attorney General interpretation of Chapter 277.10 in June 2016 and adopted by the DNR makes it impossible for the DNR to effectively regulate the proliferation of high capacity wells and difficult to adopt other rules necessary to keep Wisconsin's waters clean. The EPA can help reverse these trends by using its oversight authority to require the state of Wisconsin to administer and enforce the clean water and Safe Drinking Water Acts to protect the citizens of Wisconsin and its environment. Thank you again for taking the time to come to Wisconsin and hear the concerns of the people of Wisconsin. Jim Swanson and Max Moody, Mary Doherty. Hello, and thank you for coming down here. My name is Jim Swanson, and I'm a resident of Menominee, Wisconsin, which is about a 30-minute um, drive west of here. Um, we have two lakes in our county, um, Lakes Menominee and Retainer. Um, the city of Menominee sits around the lake. Uh, I'm, um, also, I'm also on the board of directors of the uh, Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, and I'm one of the 16 petitioners on the petition for corrective action. Um, I moved here 30 years ago, um, newly married, and about to have a child. And so we thought, what a wonderful thing to do is to buy a house on a lake and raise our children. We made the mistake of buying a house on Lake Tainer in the winter, middle of December. Um, everything was really beautiful. Uh, by June, the lake stunk so bad we couldn't open the windows in our house. The algae blooms were awful. Um, it was just really bad. And 
that was 30 years ago. At the time, the EPA said, I found out later, the EPA said that that was the most um, algae polluted lake in the United States. And um, the Nolman, which is literally downstream, and then separates the two lakes as a dam, was number three on the list. And 30 years later, it's worse. So it's, it's bad. Um, when we bought the house, uh, we had this thing called the Dream Field, and they got a perk test, which at the time I had no idea what that meant. But um, it failed, and um, so we had to build a mound. And it was rather expensive, but we found out why we needed the mound, and we're helping the lake, so we put that in. One thing that was really interesting was when we bought the house from this guy, he was bragging about this spring that he had on the northeast corner of his lake front. And he even had dug it out, and he had water, and he was bringing water in to drink, and he had a profound thing there. Well, when we put the mound in, guess what? The spring dried up. He was drinking his own sewage. And there's a lot of places on that lake that are like that. So they need help. there was a program at the time that the state had to help offset some of the cost of mound systems, but that's gone by the wayside. Now I live in the city of Menominee, I'm about four blocks away from Lake Menominee. And, and um, for all of you old folks, you probably remember the summer of love back in '69. Well, we had the summer of stench about five years ago. Um, though. About, a, about a, an area about a mile and a quarter by a mile and a quarter was so, the algae on the, it was on the north side of the lake, it smelled so bad that for weeks on end it just stunk. I mean, if you imagine taking a bunch of dirty, soiled baby diapers and putting them in a the car for about a month and they'll sit in the car. That's what it was like in our lake for almost a month. Um, a couple summers ago, the entire lake was a green carpet. I mean, it's just disgusting. And nothing. We, we, and we, are, we actually, we want to clean this lake up, and we've been trying, but we need help. Um, I see that our directors of our local lake association are here. Um, they put together one of the best um, water quality conferences in the nation, um, bringing national speakers, teaching people how to clean up the lakes, things we can do. Um, myself, I participated in many things. Um, Crowdstream habitat restorations, efforts through the Water Lake Federation. Stuff like that. We've also been projects like doing fish sticks or tree drops, you know what those are, um, different soil erosion things. But one of the most important things that happened was our county uh, passed shoreland zoning ordinance. And it was very comprehensive. It was really a model of ordinance for the um, play for the nation. And one of the key features was uh, a 35 foot buffer strip on all repairing areas. That was in 2012. Now, unfortunately, in 2015, the state legislature passed Act 55, which then took away much of the local control over such issues. And so now our county has actually had to walk back these um, shoreland zoning points. They've had to reduce um, the strength of these resolutions and these ordinances. So now they can only uh, require buffer strips on undeveloped land, which is your least likely land to uh, pollute your um, water. So we want to clean up the lake. We've tried really hard, but whenever we do, our local efforts have been shot down by the state, and we need your help. That's why the petition for corrective action, why we're here today. So we really hope you guys will help us out. Thank you. Together, trying to leverage our collective experiences, but there is massive and well documented damage caused by cables to, with the water and certainly with the air. That we kind of came together because we think that we need more protection from the EPA and the DNR. We think that the recent Wisconsin Legislative Audit Bureau report, which you mentioned earlier, is evidence of that, that regulatory failure. That we believe that we the our government's task, and EPA in particular, the DNR, is to protect the public health and safety of the citizens. And so we got together and decided you know, to leverage our collective might and expertise to kind of help us 
you know, interact with you all and figure out what we can do to, you can provide us a remedy that makes sense for us in our community and also um, keep the water clean for the folks going after us. And so we're asking you today basically just to throw us a lifeline. Something that says clean water and clean air is more important than cheap bacon and milk. Milk that is so overabundant that the federal government is buying up surplus right now. The EPA's mission statement states that you are you all are protected, you are charged with protecting human health and the environment, air, water, and land. After speaking with folks around the state, I'm telling you the someone's not doing a very good job because the air is polluted and the water is polluted in the state. And we're looking for people, we're asking you as citizens, who who are the people that can provide us the money? You know, we're told that the DNR will protect us. To a, you know, and that doesn't work, the EPA is going to protect us. From what we're seeing on the ground in communities all over the state, the DNR is advocating its duty as gatekeepers of the Wisconsin Public Trust Doctrine. It is willfully putting citizens at risk by continuing to issue new and expansion with these permits for cables and communities all over the state. And we need the EPA to step in and step up in order to fulfill your charter to protect human health and the environment. I understand that agribusiness has a lot of influence in matters in Washington. I understand that you are not elected officials. You're not the ones that write the regs that you are set to protect. But what I'm asking you to do is to explore the outer reaches of your authority in order to help us, people that live in the state, make sure that we have clean water. And I am. Um, I started a project a while ago called Words for Water, and I'm going to leave you the photos, some of them. It's a really simple project that says, I'm not, a, I'm not a naive enough to think that I'm going to see a word like precious or sacred or something like that in my rights, but I expect to see the intent of the words that are spoken in the state and the regulation and the enforcement, and we're not seeing this. And so you can, when you, when you guys are sitting in your offices, and your, something crosses your desk, I want you to remember these faces of people in Wisconsin who are telling you this is our story of water, this is what we value, in order to keep those faces in your mind that you have an opportunity to take it a little bit farther, it's still within your authority, but a little bit farther, do a little bit more for people that need to help. And um, I'll be doing my favorite quote from David Brower, who is the founder of the League of Conservation Voters. He says, polite conservationists leave no mark save the scars upon the earth that could have been prevented had they stood the ground. And we're simply asking you to stand on this line with us. Simply put, we're people who are just protecting our homes, our water and quality of life from an industry with a horrid track record of polluting and poisoning rural communities. We're asking you guys, the EPA, to provide a meaningful remedy for citizens for a fight to keep their communities safe from the dangers posed by factory farming. A regulatory remedy that goes beyond a partially tax funder, taxpayer funded pseudo clean water group of Kiwani Cape owners and ensures that Wisconsin citizens have abundant and clean water to drink. More importantly, in this time of great sea changes with the administration is changing, we ask that you, our EPA officials, throw us a bone, give us a lifeline so we have some basis on which to continue demanding the right to clean air and clean water. Nancy Utech, who will be speaking to Kiwani. She summed it up perfectly a couple weeks or a month ago in Green Bay. She said, we're just protecting special places we call home. All right. Next is going to be Mike Nicholson. Uh, Hi, welcome to Wisconsin. So I'm Kim Wright. I'm the executive director of Midwest Environmental Advocates. We're a public interest environmental law center that provides legal and technical services directly to citizens who work for all our rights. As a public interest lawyer and as a grandmother, I thank you both for your, your exemplary public service. And I really mean it. So welcome to Wisconsin. These are the great people that I get to work with all the time. Our Wisconsin conservation legacy is rooted in meaningful involvement for the public. For much of our history, our Department of Natural Resources was the big ship that pulled us all together, pulled academics, business interests, citizens, that they played a vital role. 
For 70 years, our DNR secretary was hired and fired by a citizen board, and I believe that that independence was really the root of, of um, it was one of the best science agencies in the country and a real leader in protecting water. Through budget cuts and increased influence of special interests, our DNR has really declined. Um, there are still talented men and women in our agency, but just increasingly they're unable to do their jobs. Um, it is not uncommon for our staff to hear from DNR staff that they understand that we may be right in an issue, but the people above them won't let them issue a decent permit. Um, even so, I think this breach of duty to our water is a blip in the long history of Wisconsin. We have a constitutional right to the waters of the state. Um, our legacy of citizen-led conservation and partnership with our once independent agency using sound science and open process to balance competing interests really dwarfs our recent sad past. I've been engaged in statewide conservation for close to 30 years. The people of Wisconsin continue to care about clean water and our common duty to future generations. The past several years, citizens have taken on the costs and the burdens of protecting our water when our government can't or won't. Although I'm in awe of the growing number of people standing together, we need an effective government faithfully acting as our trustee to have clean water. The role of your agency in restoring our state's compliance with the Clean Water Act has directly supported the work of citizens from all political backgrounds from every corner of the state. The 16 Wisconsin residents who filed the petition for corrective action in 2015 are all good people like Jim Swanson, who've worked for years in their communities through all the channels available to them to solve very serious water pollution problems that threaten public health and our aquatic resources. The need for the petition became even more evident when not long after its filing, the nonpartisan report from the Wisconsin Legislative Audit Bureau showed a significant gap between the WIPDES program and minimum Clean Water Act requirements. No matter how hardworking and smart the people of Wisconsin are, we can't replace the role of government as the trustee of our clean water future. I ask you and your dedicated staff to continue to work diligently to bring Wisconsin back into compliance with the Clean Water Act. Wisconsin was an early leader in implementing the Clean Water Act, and shamefully, we are now again polluting waters that we've already invested time and resources to clean up. I'd like to end by reading the words of our founding board president, Arlen Christensen, who is also the founder of the Public Interveners, uh, lawyers that were in our State Department of Justice that did the work we did, uh, directly represented citizens, uh, one of our great Wisconsin citizens. The waters of Wisconsin belong to us, the people of Wisconsin. Underlying every act of the legislature and the DNR, is the fundamental fact that they act not as owners, but as trustees for the true owners, we the people. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. And as one of the representatives one of the other organizers, thank you so much for all of you for coming out tonight. It's a great turnout. My name is Michael Eggleston. I'm the executive director of Wisconsin Lakes, a statewide nonprofit conservation organization representing lake organizations across Wisconsin. I'm here tonight to express the belief of my members in the fundamental need for laws and regulations that ensure clean, safe, and plentiful surface and groundwater, and for the need that the agencies and officials tasked with implementing those laws and regulations remain adequately funded, fully staffed, and focused on the duties that are incumbent upon. Wisconsin Lakes represents waterfront property owners, lake users, lake associations, and lake districts, who in turn represent over 80,000 citizens and property owners. Our mission is to conserve, enhance, and restore Wisconsin lakes to ensure their sustainability for the benefit and collective use and enjoyment for this and future generations. We all know the lakes of Wisconsin face many issues. Aggressive development of shorelines, aquatic invasive species, artificial drawdowns from overuse of connected groundwater, 
and many more. But water quality from polluted runoff is certainly a prime issue for many lakes around the state and is no doubt of importance to many in attendance here tonight. While the drivers of polluted runoff are many, commitment to limiting its impacts should be unified. This is not an issue that should divide by party, political ideology, economic class, or any other division. It should be self-apparent that clean water benefits us all in ways ecological, cultural, and economic, and that we must continue to improve a framework that promotes clean water. Wisconsinites are rightfully proud of their heritage of strong protections of our state's waters especially as reflected in the Delegation of Clean Water Act enforcement to our state government by the EPA. We believe that in large part, we've done a pretty good job over the last several decades fulfilling our duty, and the benefits of meshing Clean Water Act duties with the duty of the state to protect our water under our public trust doctrine has worked to the benefit of the waters of Wisconsin. But in more recent years, a rising movement in Wisconsin is working to scale back those historic protections. And we fear this movement will continue in the near future and will potentially even spread into our federal government. So to protect our waters and ensure that we maintain the cultural, recreational, ecological, and economical benefits I referred to, Wisconsin Lakes calls for the following. EPA needs to remain fully funded and staffed and committed to fully enforcing the Clean Water Act. And I understand that the two of you probably don't have a whole lot to do about that. EPA must hold Wisconsin state government to its obligations under its delegation of authority from EPA and act decisively if it determines those obligations are not being met. As part of meeting those obligations, Wisconsin must ensure a fully funded, fully staffed Department of Natural Resources that is committed to water quality protection and improvement in Wisconsin and that is committed to meeting and possibly exceeding its obligations under both its EPA delegated authority and the public trust document. And all of us, EPA, DNR, other areas of state and local government in Wisconsin, and the citizens and property owners of the state as well, must work together to improve our water quality laws and regulations, to innovate new ways to manage our watersheds, and to come together under one banner of clean, plentiful water for now and the future. Whether our waters turn green with algae, as they too often do now, or brown with the industrial sludge of a hopefully bygone era, no one benefits in the long run unless we continue working to fix the problem. We hope EPA remains strong and continues to aggressively enforce the Clean Water Act, and we hope that our state follows suit in its own management of our waters. I'm here to, to declare that the lake organizations, the waterfront property owners, and friends of lakes that make up my organization, Wisconsin Lakes, will be here to support you, and if necessary, to push you forward in that effort. Thank you for allowing me to address you this evening. I come before you as a county board member, Dunn County Board of Supervisors, and a former village president of 10 years of the village of Colfax. Uh, I take very seriously my duties as an elected official to safeguard our water. I have some questions here that I would like to pass along, and I would like, uh, I'll submit them in my questions in writing at a later date. But who is in charge of our water locally? Townships, villages, county, state, federal, who? What enforcement tools do they have? If a business pollutes or affects neighbors' wells, who is responsible? Who pays? How is water furnished to the tainted wells or owner? And finally, this is a question as it relates to municipalities. Uh, with the advent of all these high capacity wells, I have a, a, a concern for our water level uh, and our water table. Does a municipality have more power or a higher interest in clean water versus a business or a single landowner who affects adversely the water or purity of the water? These are things that, uh, questions that I would like answers to, so as a county board member and a village president, I can make some informed and uh, uh, decent decisions. Thank you very much. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to address the Environmental Protection Agency this evening. My name is Raj Shukla. I'm the Executive Director of the River Alliance of Wisconsin, which is a statewide organization that advocates for the protection, enhancement, and restoration of Wisconsin's rivers and watersheds. 
I'm here on behalf of our 3,500 members to urge the EPA to engage collaboratively and aggressively to manage our pressing freshwater concerns. Now, there's little debate about the problems Wisconsin faces on water quality, quantity, and accessibility issues. We know that tap water reeks of animal waste from industrial farms in Kiwanee County. Hundreds of thousands of Wisconsin residents are at risk of illness from waterborne pathogens in private and public drinking water supplies. We know that data collected by state agencies show an estimated one in five private wells in Wisconsin's agricultural areas produce water unsafe to drink due to nitrate levels. We know that communities from Milwaukee, the Milwaukee area to Nakusa and over to Green Bay struggle every day with phosphorus runoff from livestock manure and agricultural fertilizers. Toxic algae is all too common and local water agencies must spend vast sums to address the problem. Lakeshore businesses have lost customers from the thick, foul-smelling algae, and family cabins are going unused through big stretches of the summer across the state. We can see water is disappearing in the Central Sands region, and we know where much of it goes to feed mega farms that together pump millions of gallons a day from local water sources. People who live in modest Central Sands communities have seen their water levels in local lakes retreat, and they fear their property values will fall too. We know the State Department of Natural Resources no longer honors its historic responsibility to enforce common sense guidelines for water management in the region. And we know people are worried and increasingly impatient with inaction from decision makers. Clean Wisconsin, along with local organizations like Pleasant Lake Management District, have filed suit to require state government to uphold their duty and protect Wisconsin's rivers and waters. Residents uh, like those in the Central Sands Water Action Coalition, that's 59 organizations representing more than 32,000 households, have self-organized to work tirelessly to demand fair use of water resources among the diverse interests that live in that region. Uh, a, Northern public, a Northern College public opinion poll of four northern counties published last May found 84% of respondents say the public sector should be responsible for guaranteeing public access to safe drinking water. And this fall, the River Alliance of Wisconsin, along with Wisconsin Lakes, have worked with near 100 residents from lake organizations across the state to support common sense water protections and preserve local control. Gatherings were held in Rhinelander, Spooner, and Oconomowoc, cities represented by both Republicans and Democrats. Clean water is a bipartisan concern. The question we all have today, especially in light of the events of the last week, is how will the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency help? Uh, there are plenty of options, many of which will be discussed and have already been touched on. I want to emphasize a few. First, Fund and support flexible and cost-effective options to control pollution. Wisconsin, with EPA's full support, needs to continue to pursue innovative and effective policies to curb phosphorus pollution that turns our lakes, rivers, and streams green with algae every summer. Approving the multi-discharge variants will provide point source permit holders compliance options that reduce the financial compliance burden placed upon them while being able to direct money at non-point source pollution from agriculture. Second thing, fund and support collaborative solutions. We, we also need more tools and resources to reduce phosphorus pollution from agriculture. The MDV, multi-discharge variants, uh, like nutrient trading and watershed shed adaptive management before it will provide some new funding but will not solve our water quality problems alone. Targeting funding toward on-the-ground conservation professionals to work with farmers to implement conservation, as well as enforcing existing agricultural performance standards, is a valuable role EPA could play in Wisconsin. <coughs> Fund and support needed water management infrastructure. That's the third and final thing I'll emphasize. Infrastructure that uses modern design techniques can manage stormwater efficiently while it improves water quality. We urge the EPA to direct funding and support to communities that must dramatically upgrade water infrastructure to deal with new and intense climate, uh, climate and public health realities. So we know the problems. We have some idea of the solutions. We have every interest in working together to manage water resources wisely. What we do not yet know is how committed the EPA 
EPA is to assist us as we work to protect this planet's most essential resource. Uh, we're living in a state that borders 20% of the world's global surface fresh water. The importance of this resource couldn't be understated. We're hopeful the new administration will recognize the environmental and economic value of clean fresh water, and we're eager to, eager to solve problems together alongside community groups, industry representatives, and local decision makers. Thanks so much. When clean water comes up before our legislators, Wisconsinites care, and they will stand up and they will they will fight to protect their homes and their families. But unfortunately, in the last several legislative sessions, that hasn't been enough. And so what I quickly want to give for you is the context in which the DNR is operating in our current political climate. Because um, over the last le the decade, the legislature really has undermined DNR's ability to do its job, both by slashing its funding, but then also um, passing legislation that directly undermines its mission. So I, I went through my notes and found just in the last three legislative sessions, there were 16 bills that directly undermined clean water in the state of Wisconsin. Of those 16, 11 were passed by the legislature and signed into law by Governor Walker. And I want to give you an idea of how overreaching a lot of this legislation is. Here are some of the general themes of what we are seeing the DNR dealing with. Um, we are seeing bills that require the DNR to issue general permits without environmental assessments if, if basic bureaucratic conditions are met. Basically, did they get it in on time? Did they use the right font? That kind of thing. Not actually the condition of the permit. We're seeing bills that include language that state for certain industries, most notably iron mining, environmental standards don't apply. We're, like, we're passing laws that say that, and I think we'll see more. We're seeing legislation that has removed or severely undermined public access to information or the ability of citizens to challenge permits that affect their neighborhoods and their quality of life. And finally, we are seeing legislation passed that prohibit local governments from enacting higher water quality standards or practices than the state at the same time that the legislature is undermining DNR's ability to enforce the law. We are under a lot of pressure here in the state, and it is not for lack of uh, ability of citizens to make their case known, but we need help from the EPA. Because right now, there is no check on this at the state level. And so we are asking the EPA to thoroughly investigate the well-documented problems with the DNR Clean Water Programs. And we're asking you to require the state of Wisconsin to make the changes and the investments needed to protect our drinking water. Thank you so much for being here and for listening to all of us. Just oh, real quick, I also brought a petition with a bunch of our members that have signed, and I will leave that with them. Thank you. Jeff Smith, next up is Allison Werner. Thank you for being here. Um, we're all very grateful that you're here. I, I, I can, you know, so many people showed up. It's an obvious, obvious thank you to you. Um, I'm, I'm here with Citizen Action Organizing Cooperative. We are an organization, as the name suggests, of citizens who, who really believe in, in uh, economic justice, environmental justice, election fairness, those sorts of things that we decide, we make a decision whether or not um, they're worthy of of putting our efforts and resources behind. And obviously, clean water is something worth every, that everyone believes we should get behind. What I brought today um, is eight testimonials from people who couldn't be here today. They emailed them to me, and I'm going to turn them into the box, and I hope that you get an opportunity to check them out because they put a lot of thought into them. But I also like to make sure I always talk to this wonderful group of citizens that are here. It is just amazing to me, and I hope to you when you look around the room, that people who may have, especially when we're coming out of an election campaign that divided us in so many ways, that everyone here is sitting here today, you don't care how people voted. You know, everybody here didn't vote the same way. But when it comes to what's really important, when it comes, when we get away from the rhetoric that, that politicians divide us with, we come together for what's important. 
and what affects us all. Clean water is important to everyone in this room and everyone that you represent as your neighbors and your siblings and your children and grandchildren. And I want to thank you all for being here because you are today showing and demonstrating what democracy is about. And last thing I want to mention is that I'm, I'm a former legislator myself. And one of the things that I like to remind people of is professionals like you and how important it is that legislators and politicians of all sorts listen to the professionals. Remember who they are and I understand what difficult positions you're in because oftentimes the agencies and bureaus, whether it be state or federal level, are not able to do the job that they are hired for because of pol politics getting in the way. And I feel for you in that regard, but I hope that in any possible way, you're able to get over that hurdle and help the citizens of this country and in this state because we need you now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Allison Warner, next will be Nancy Lutash. Hi, I'm Allison Warner. I work for the River Alliance of Wisconsin, and I did a little bit extra bill because Jeff just did a really great job of talking about how important everything you all do is. What I do for River Alliance is support citizens just like you. I see many of you sitting in this room who I know have worked so hard to protect your waters in your neighborhoods, your community, and around the state. So I want to thank you all for being here tonight. One of the groups I work with is the Central Sands Water Action Coalition, and that's who I'm speaking on behalf of tonight. Um, the person that was going to come, unfortunately, wasn't able to come at the last minute. Um, the Central Sands Coalition uh, was mentioned earlier. It's a coalition of 59 organizations representing 32,000 members and their families. Wisconsinites have always enjoyed an abundance of both surface waters and groundwater. For this reason, groundwater has been perceived as a virtually unlimited resource in our state. However, over the past decade, it has become painfully apparent that this underlying premise is no longer true. In the Central Sands region of Wisconsin, approval and installation of hundreds of agricultural high capacity wells per year has contributed to substantial depletion of water levels in lakes, rivers, and streams, and the frequent drying of stream segments. For example, in, in the 1950s, uh, Central, in, in Wisconsin Central Sands area, there was 165 high capacity wells. By 1970, the number was 1,470. Today, the number is 3,200 high capacity wells, and additional requests for new high capacity wells continue to be made. In Wisconsin, we currently have over 14,000 high capacity wells that pump groundwater from our aquifers. Lakes and streams in Wisconsin Central Sands have a water loss problem. When the water is lost, a water quality problem follows right behind. The sandy nature of the soil and bedrock make the central sands highly susceptible to groundwater pollution. Uh, there's, in the notes, there's a packet of maps where there is a map that shows the vulnerability areas in the state that highlights the central sands, uh, that has this vulnerability to groundwater contamination and also currently nitrate pollution problems in the groundwater. Uh, this evening I want to emphasize two points, the link between that water quality and quantity and the importance that our State Department of Natural Resources has the tools and authority to protect our water. Human demands on Wisconsin's water include agriculture, industrial processes, recreation, and drinking water. In Wisconsin Central Sands region, the majority of that water is pumped. In, two, in 2014, that was 224 billion gallons. Some of this water is returned to the aquifer, most is lost. The water that is returned does not match that, that that is extracted. It is tainted with nitrates, phosphates, pesticides, antibiotics, and more. Almost 34% of Wisconsin's private drinking water wells contain detectable pesticide residues. In heavy agricultural areas, 20 to 30% of Wisconsin drinking water wells contain nitrates in, in excess of state standards. Wisconsin Central Sands has been identified as an area of the state that is highly susceptible to groundwater pollution. And it's also an area that is heavily pumped. And again, uh, when you look at the maps in there, you'll see that connection, that pumping and pollution are linked. For the DNR, they need their tools back in their toolbox. Uh, for groundwater, this includes a cumulative impact analysis. Three recent court decisions provided Wisconsin the path to protect its groundwater. We were on the right path to protect our groundwater. However, in July 2016, that was mentioned earlier this evening, 
Our Attorney General stated that he thought the Wisconsin DNR did not have the authority to use cumulative impact analysis or require monitoring wells be installed to evaluate groundwater pumping. His opinion has been adopted by the DNR and has rolled back groundwater protection in Wisconsin, um, again, taking one of DNR's tools away from them. Attorney Schimmel's opinion and DNR's support for it have not only re reversed a Wisconsin Supreme Court decision, a court of appeals decision, and an agency contested court case, but it's also placed all Wisconsin waters in jeopardy. In conclusion, uh, Wisconsin has had minimal regulation of groundwater. In order to save our water resources and vegetable industry, which is dependent on irrigation, Wisconsin must develop a sustainable groundwater management plan and institute groundwater management practices to protect water quantity and quality. We ask that the EPA help Wisconsin protect our waters, both surface water and the aquifers under the ground. Protection that will include the ability and authority for DNR to use appropriate tools to conduct environmental review of existing and new high capacity wells, including cumulative impact analysis. The installation of monitoring wells to provide data for evaluation and the authority to use that information to permit, condition, or deny high capacity well requests. We thank you so much for coming to Wisconsin and listening tonight to our groundwater issues and the challenges for, uh, for your consideration of the points we've made. Thank you. Nancy Utesh, and next up is Patrick Wilson. Uh, good evening. I'm Nancy Utesh from Kewanee County, Wisconsin. This room sits 170 people, and there's an overflow, so they're saying about 200 people are here this evening. That's good news for water. I'm a farmer and I'm one of the petitioners who filed for the emergency actions found under the Safe Drinking Water Act in October of 2014, two years ago, to the EPA. Tonight, I'd like to ask all in this room to bear witness to Kiwani County's plight. And I'd like to ask all members present to please stand with our community as we continue to seek social and environmental justice where we live. Two years ago and several times since, we've asked for a listening session in our contaminated county with the EPA. A month ago, another family living in Luxembourg had manure coming out of their faucet, deeming their water unusable. The troubling thing with this family, like many residents, dangerously play this game every day, roulette, with the safety of their water. This family, like many families, knew, knew that during certain times of the year, their water is poisoned, and that's acceptable. They simply don't drink their water anymore. But they continue to bathe and expose their body, their skin, the largest breathing organ, on the human body to toxicity that harms human health. What compounds the tragedy for this family is that there is a family member who is suffering from cancer in the homestead that now has no water. For the immune suppressed, contaminated water contains threats that may further exacerbate health issues. Since the Safe Drinking Water Petition was filed, we have continued ongoing contamination occurring where we live. We also have many new CAFO expansions occurring in tandem with the ongoing contamination and new contamination that occurs in our community on a regular basis. Insult to injury has now come to our community and that some of the perpetrators now are coming forth to supply water to the victims who suffered from their pollution. This has been an acceptable remedy that has been lauded by not only the EPA, but the DNR, our health department, and also our state senator. So if you live in Kiwani County, like the Balza family in Luxembourg, 
You can have water delivered to your home, quite possibly, by the farmer that just ruined your water for your homestead. Which, by the way, was two taxpayer grants from DadCap. So when you hear the good kind of people in Kiwani County that are supplying water to victims, it's the taxpayers that are providing that water. Our community would like a listening session for Kiwani County set by the EPA immediately, if not sooner. We've waited long enough. The posturing, politics, and putting off has gone on for way too long. Two years too long. When will the EPA actively help Kiwani County? When will the EPA come in to investigate our causes for contamination and the ongoing pollution. When will the EPA, designed to protect, protect the citizens where I live? When will both the EPA and our health department respond to what Judge Jeffrey Bolt described as massive regulatory failure and the resulting water contamination characterized as that which one would expect to find in a third world country. We recognize the special interest in industry that have wielded their power and influence over the very agencies designed to protect us. Kiwani County seeks protection now from the EPA and our health department in responding to our critical health crisis and a water emergency that has gone on for too long without safeguards made to stem the ongoing contamination and pollution. We would like that listening session now. We seek protection now. Let the wait be over for Kiwani County. For the three minutes that I've spoken tonight, it constituted a 460 mile round trip drive, seven hours in my vehicle, and quite possibly an overnight stay at a hotel. Please hear the voices of the people here tonight. We need the help of the Environmental Protection Agency. Bills from the DNR on compliance by the 17 WPDES permit holders in the county. The DNR's response was that all permit holders in the county are in substantial compliance, whatever that is, but provided none of the details the county had asked for. Uh, number two, demanding the DNR issue violation notices when permit holders are out of compliance. And the DNR wrote that permit holders do not get official violation notices when they violate condition of their permits due to the DNR's stepped enforcement approach to WPDES violations. And the DNR didn't indicate what, if anything, would lead to a violation notice being issued. Uh, number three, the county asked to ensure that DNR inspection records are electronically recorded and accessible to the public. The DNR said it's working on upgrading its data system to ensure efficiencies for staff use and also to provide complete transparency to our process, of our processes to the public. So they blame the computers for lack of public access to records. And number four, the county asked that WPDES permits not be renewed without inspections. And uh, that, I don't know if the DNR even responded to. I don't have the uh, answer there. But it took four months for the DNR to provide this unacceptable response to the county board's request. Board member Mike Giese said his first response to the letter was anger. It was so blatantly deficient and contained absolutely no content, he said. Board member Monica Cruz, chair of the Health and Human Resources Committee, said it just seems like there's really not a very sincere response to any of these concerns. So the next step for the county board is to file an open records request with the DNR to get access to inspection records. And the main county board concern here is uh, Babcock Genetics CAFO, where tests this summer on private property surrounding the CAFO have shown elevated levels of nitrates and coliform bacteria, and yet no known notice of violation has been issued to that cut. So if this is the response the Wisconsin DNR provides to the County of La Crosse governing body, 
how will the average citizen of Wisconsin get satisfaction when they ask the DNR to do its job to protect uh, the waters of the state? Um, so please help us. Don Hamas, next is Eleanor Wolf. I'm not going to speak all of it, please. Then next will be Jamie Mara. Thank you, uh, Administrator Kaplan, for giving me and the others here today this opportunity to provide comments regarding Wisconsin's many water problems. My name is Don Hamas, and I'm Vice Chair of the John Muir Chapter of the Sierra Club. I am also past president of the Dane County Conservation League and former director and wetlands committee chair for the Wisconsin Wildlife Federation. I was going to prepare some remarks for today's listing session, but then came across a newspaper article by Representative Katrina Shecklin, Assistant Minority Leader in the Wisconsin Assembly and member of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources mm -hmm. and Sporting Heritage, that pretty much said exactly what I wanted to say. The title of the article is Wisconsin's groundwater is at crisis point. Please let me read some of what she had to say. Quote, Every person in Wisconsin deserves access to clean, safe, and bountiful water, regardless of zip code. Yet in Kewaunee County, about one in three wells tested for nitrates or bacteria are considered undrinkable. Concerns about radium in the water are significant in southeast Wisconsin. In western Wisconsin, residents are worried about the impacts of frac sand mining on water. In the central sands area of our state, an ongoing debate about both water quality and quantity is happening. And in northeastern Wisconsin, dead zones punctuate the debate on water. In 81 communities across Wisconsin, residential water systems contain unsafe levels of lead. How did Wisconsin, with all of our vast water resources, <coughs> become a state where people have to worry about access to clean water? Over the past five years, Republican legislators have exempted certain wetlands from water quality standards, restricted the Department of Natural Resources from regulating agricultural waste, and cut final DNR scientist positions, making it more difficult to tackle the root causes behind groundwater contamination and ensure everyone has safe drinking water. Recently, the nonpartisan Legislative Auto Bureau released an audit of DNR's wastewater permitting and enforcement practices, and the results were deeply troubling. The LAB audit found that concentrated animal feeding operations have little or no DNR oversight. Currently, CAFOs have no runoff testing requirements and are instead required to file self-monitored reports annually with the DNR. Of those self-monitored reports, only 36 of the roughly 1,900 required to be submitted had been electronically recorded as being received. That's less than 2%. When the DNR fails to monitor and enforce its own runoff policies, it's no wonder we have contaminated wells. I'm almost at the end. Last fall, Democratic legislators, Representative Eric Genrich and Senator Dave Hansen, introduced legislation that would have required the DNR to establish acceptable manure spreading practices in areas of the state that are susceptible to groundwater contamination. Republicans never even gave the bill a public hearing. 
This summer, after significant public pressure mounted, the DNR proposed rewriting rules for manure spreading by Kehoe's, limiting the amount of manure that could be applied per acre. Unfortunately, Governor Walker scaled back the rule considerably. And so you can see, Mr. Kaplan, there are some serious water problems in Wisconsin. As the past five years have shown, the state legislature, controlled by the Republicans in both houses, is not likely to seriously address these water safety problems. The DNR is seriously understaffed. Their budget has been cut year after year. Enforcement is down and the scientific staff has been cut in half. The DNR secretary, appointed by Governor Walker, is not doing much about our water problems, except holding meetings on the top. Clearly, the EPA needs to use its oversight authority to require the state of Wisconsin to administer and enforce the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act to protect the citizens of Wisconsin. Jamie Mora, and next up will be Ann Temple. Thank you, gentlemen, for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Jamie Mara, and I work for the Dairy Business Association, a nonprofit organization of farmers and a host of other businesses and services that make up the dairy community in Wisconsin. I'm here tonight to talk about progressive efforts by farmers on all size farms in this state to care for our natural resources. Through an increasing number of farmer-led watershed initiatives, farmers are voluntarily developing aggressive programs to raise the bar on environmental stewardship. The programs, often organized as nonprofit organizations, promote the current best known management practices and identify through research and demonstration additional best practices to protect our environment. They provide other farmers with information on what they learn and they help those farmers incorporate those practices. These initiatives are about results. Members commit to continuous improvement in areas such as surface water and groundwater quality. Farmers use scientific methods to measure progress. In the Madison area, one such group, the Harp Pride Farms, is dramatically reducing the amount of algae causing phosphorus that reaches the lakes there. In Dora and Kiwani counties, Peninsula Pride Farms is mapping fields to identify shallow soils, leveraging the use of cover crops, and creating a collaborative community spirit in tackling decades old groundwater challenges. The farmers work with universities and state and federal agencies to do what is right. As producers on the land, farmers are very proud of what they do. They've also worked on effective solutions are socially, economically, and environmentally sound. <coughs> Farmers are inventive and creative, mm -hmm. and these programs help them harness and leverage those qualities to adapt and improve. The programs demonstrate farmers' collective commitment to protecting and preserving our natural resources. We all share in this responsibility. Farmers play a lead role, and they take it seriously. Just as their non-farming neighbors do, farmers need the land, air, and water to be safe. Safe for their families, their workers, and their animals. And they work diligently to make that happen. We all have the same goal. There are already numerous state and federal regulations, particularly on large farms, that build environmental protections into the farming practices. For example, book thick nutrient management plans detail, among other things, when, where, and how much manure and other fertilizer can be applied to fields. Water and soil samples are continuously monitored and the farms are inspected. Although CAFO farmers are the ones most often targeted by people with the greatest concerns about the environment, these large farms are among the most progressive when it comes to stewardship of our natural resources. Large-scale farmers are willing and able to invest in expensive technology used to minimize their environmental footprint anaerobic digesters, water recycling, and precis precision manure application are examples. These investments of time and money also eventually benefit other farms, large and small, by helping companies perfect the technologies and make them more affordable. It is unfortunate that misinformation about CAFOs is widely circulated. 
Not nearly enough people have seen for themselves how it all works, and plenty of farmers are ready and willing to provide a tour. Lastly, I would, I would like to say that it's unfortunate that certain outside interests work to create controversy and bring about division in local farm communities. Fingers are pointed, accusations are made, reputations are ruined without reason, and neighbors are pitted against neighbors. My hope and that of our organization is that farmers be shown the respect they deserve and that all sides of these issues be given due consideration. Thank you for your time. And Temple, next up is Rachel Coomer. And forgive me if I butcher your names. Mine's pretty phonetic. Hi, thanks for having me. And I have to say, I'm really happy to see all these people here because Sometimes I think one of our biggest enemies is apathy, so it's good to see. Anyway, hi, my name is Ann Temple. I drove up from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm a Midwest leader for Moms Across America, and I'm here today to demand that the EPA ban the use of glyphosate, which has been shown in study after study by independent scientists to cause harm not only to our water supply and our environment, but to the human and animal population as well. In the U.S. and Wisconsin, widespread adoption of genetically modified crops has shown an increase of weed-killing herbicides, specifically glyphosate, as weeds have become more resistant, leading to serious environmental damage. Although the Safe Drinking Water Act was originally passed by Congress in 1974 to protect public health by protecting drinking water and its sources including rivers, lakes, reservoirs, springs, and groundwater wells, the federal government tests for about 200 pesticides does not test for glyphosate. Glyphosate, or Roundup, as it is more commonly called, and the many other glyphosate-based products in the market today, is the most widely used herbicide worldwide, with over 128,000 metric tons of it being sold last year alone. Moms Across America has found 0.33 parts per billion in U.S. tap water, which is much higher than the 0.1 part per billion permitted in the drinking water in the European Union. The U.S. permits 700 parts per billion of glyphosate in our tap water, when levels at a fraction of that have been shown to cause severe organ damage, alter gene function, and cause harm to the liver and kidneys in the rats tested. We feel that EPA has failed us. Here are some of the reasons why. The EPA's approval policy calls for the manufacturer to submit studies for review showing the safety of only the one declared active chemical ingredient in a product and not the final formulation. A product will always have adjuvants or so-called inert ingredients to improve the product's performance, but at what cost? In the case of glyphosate, the testing was performed that showed these adjuvants made the final formulation over 1,000 times more toxic, or one of the most toxic herbicides on the planet. While the EPA has said that they have hundreds of studies showing glyphosate safety, there are no long-term animal studies on these final formulations, and there has never been a single long-term human study, barring the one we are all being subjected to right now. Not only is this toxic chemical formulation found in our groundwater, it is found in our treated tap water, our children's urine, breast milk, bread, cereal, eggs, milk, beer, wine, and most recently found in all of the childhood vaccines that we tested. Glyphosate was classified a probable human carcinogen by the World Health Organization's cancer agency, IARC, in 2015. The only way to stop this ubiquitous poison from destroying our environment is to ban its use now, as we don't have several years for the EPA to stonewall us, as they did by postponing the glyphosate review meeting in October. We simply do not have time on our side. By 2032, just 16 years, one out of three of our children born will be diagnosed with autism if we continue at the current rate. We cannot afford to continue to increase the toxic burden of our children, and we cannot afford GMO chemical farming. We cannot afford these toxic chemicals in our groundwater anymore. We are asking the EPA to deny relicensing of glyphosate and to start working with other government agencies to work with farmers to convert to using sustainable, organic practices that will benefit us all. We need to start employing the precautionary principle. We need to stop the use of spraying these toxins on our food, which is leaching into our groundwater and into every facet of our lives. Thank you. Next up is Denise Simon. 
My name is Rachel Coomer, and I am a dairy farmer. Um, and I agree with previous testimony that I am proud of the work that I do. Um, I believe that farmers have made lots of strides. They are innovative, and um, lots of them do um, voluntarily make changes to protect the water. Unfortunately, not all of them do. And there lies my problem. I would like to talk about my frustrations in dealing with the DMR, DNR with my neighboring dairy. This dairy is planning a major expansion, about five times the size they currently are, and they are planning on selling their farm out to a dairy processing plant. Um, because of this, they had to go through several steps. They're working on getting their permit. First, there was a scheduled site inspection, which came with numerous violations of their current WPDES permit. When asked with the DNR why nothing has happened with any of those things, they said that, well, the expansion will fix the problem. <laughs> the problem with this logic is that they already are capable. They already were supposed to fix these problems. Some of them are simple as in leachate collected from the bunkers that is then supposed to be pumped to the manure pit. The pump isn't on. Why? Because I don't want the water in the pit. So what are we going to do about that? Just let them turn it off? That's okay? Those are one of the things. The other part was their permit application and their new nutrient management plan. They had to put in a new one, show that they had the land base to get rid of the 56 million gallons of manure that they're supposed to be creating. They did not even ask some of the landowners for permission. And that's what they turned into the DNR. This plan was sent back to the farm to redo it. We fraudulently lied on a form, a form that we gave to the government and nothing is happening other than fix it. The only reason these came to light is because there was the public hearing and some of the other dairy farmers in my community went through their nutrient management plan and found these discrepancies. We have asked for a second hearing. We have asked for another chance to look at the new plan that they have recently submitted and we have been told that that won't happen. Now, how are they going to know that this plan is correct when they didn't know the first one was? They've had a fertilizer spill this summer, major fertilizer spill, that they were supposed to report. That is in your plan. That is in your permit, self-reporting. They did not do it. It was found by a bow hunter this fall. There is a dead zone 30 feet long from where the tank was right into the creek of liquid fertilizer. The soil tests so high in ammonia that they can't even test exactly how much is in it on this bond beyond their calibration curve. And they were told to clean it up, but that's it. The processing plant that is planning on taking over this farm has already been prosecuted by the DNR for repeatedly uh, for um, violating their WPDS permit. And from what I have told, they are continuing to do this. Although I agree that the farming has taken some serious leaps and bounds, things are better, but this is strong evidence that there is no incentive other than your own personal goodwill to do what's right. And not everyone has that. This self-regulation, limited disciplinary action, no real consequences, limited oversight, has set us up for major catastrophe. If this business can't do it now, how are they going to do it at five times their size? Hi, my name is Denise Segan from Bayfield, and um, like many people, I will drive seven hours round trip, and I appreciate your being here. I'll jump right now to corroborate the uh, concept of the nutrient management plans not being accurate. I moved to the area to where the 26,000 hog capo will be, Reeks capo. Mike, please. And um, I, moved the, the oh, sorry. <laughs> I moved there last year, and I started calling my neighbors listed in the nutrient management plan, and they didn't know what I was talking about. They do not have contracts to put manure on their fields. And then they wrote the DNR to get their names removed. But this is a common thread in the industry. When I've spoken about it to other organizations, they've all confirmed this. So where will 10 million gallons of manure go? 
that's supposed to be on the shores of Lake Superior. Um, the citizens of Ashland get their drinking water from the surface waters at the CAPO site. When the mayor of Ashland asked DNR to suspend Reed's CAPO permitting process to assess the problem, the response was as follows. You must understand that if the owner of the facility meets all the statutory and administrative code requirements, the department cannot deny him a permit. This formal DNR statement demonstrates that the state will grant this permit, irrespective of the EIS process, irrespective of the, of the Safe Drinking Water Act, irrespective of the impaired waters of which South Fish Creek is one where the capo sits, um, and irrespective of the fact that the fields on which the capo spread manure are oversaturated with phosphorus by state and federal standards, and without the DNR itself being in compliance with the Clean Water Act. EPA, we ask you to give us a lifeline and explore ways to save our drinking water. With climate change, I, I got to experience 13 feet of, from an ankle deep tributary that goes right where that Cape Oak site is. It was ankle deep and the next day in six hours it was 13 feet and, and 100 feet wide, where it's usually just six feet wide. Um, there are no current ways in our um, DNR rules that incorporate the climate, the NOAA information um, that includes this kind of massive rainfall, and yet that's where our capo is going to sit. Those uh, hogs would have washed away and the um, manure with it into Lake Superior. You're probably aware, sir, that I submitted an Article 6 notification under the Great Lakes Compact um, so that the Canadians and the tribes are aware of this potential pollution. If you need a copy, let me know. Um, local tribes and residents of Bayfield and Ashton County have expressed concern for environmental justice. It's a very low income area. The tribes are especially concerned with their fishing and ricing rights. The EPA should follow the Washington State's Culvert case, which protects <coughs> off-reservation tribal fishing resources. It is time to develop <coughs> policy to protect these shared waters with the tribes in Canada. Mm -hmm. Greeks Cave Folk will generate as much sewage as a city of 50,000 people, according to their John Hopkins letter that we asked them to analyze. There are, no, there are not enough acres on which to apply manure safely for all that is produced by CAFOs in this state without polluting the waterways. The EPA must act before you are obsolete in the com coming political sea change. Tell us what magic words we can invoke to cause your action to agency to act. Put a moratorium on CAFOs in the, so in the Lake Superior watershed and the siting of CAFOs in the source water of municipalities. Clearly identify the problem and remedy so we can follow through with our own actions, set a sailing in the right direction for the rough seas ahead. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, I guess my uh, issues have been talked about here quite a bit on uh, the water. Uh, my, I'm across from uh, where this new system is coming in, uh, and my well went dry here in 2011. There was no water. And, uh, at this time I didn't have, uh, I used to have cattle on the, on the place and a uh, full family and, and it, uh, it went ran dry. Because of the irrigation, in 2011, they were irrigating 24/7. So the irrigation was going on 24 hours a day, and um, I guess this has been spoken about before. I guess, and that's all I have to say. And thank you. So we uh, we need to take a biological break here for like five minutes, <laughs> uh, and then but we should be able to get through everybody that wants to speak. So citizens came together to request the state legislature to fund the cost of a TMDL of the Wisconsin River. The project came to fruition with an investment of over $2 million. The Wisconsin River has been measured, monitored, studied, and data collected for the first time in history.
This science-based data reveals the nutrient level entering the river from the many tributaries that feed it. This data is intended to drive change on the landscape, to implement best management practices to reduce the loading of nutrients in the river, with a major, with a major focus of phosphorus reduction. High-risk areas need to be accurately identified and then prioritized for management practices that will minimize phosphorus loss. The completion of the Wisconsin River TMDL identifies these areas and now needs to be the driving force of change needed in order for the water quality to improve to meet EPA standards. One of the many tributaries included in the TMDL is Ten Mile Creek, which flows into the, into the Wisconsin River in Wood County at the site of a proposed cable. Information collected at the mouth of Ten Mile Creek indicates the amount of phosphorus entering the river at this location is 55 parts per million, an amount already 5 parts per million higher than the recommended reduction to 50 parts per million, that which has been determined to achieve water quality that will meet EPA standards. As stated in the publication Food, Land, and Water, written by James Madsen, who served 28 years as Chief Legal Counsel for DADCAP, he states soil erosion is the primary vehicle by which phosphorus moves from land from farms to lakes. Phosphorus loading causes lake eutrophication and potential toxic algae blooms, which is a very accurate descriptor of the present state of peat well and Castle Rock. He states that a 1,000 cow dairy operation produces as much fecal waste as Stevens Point, a city of 25,000 people. This proposed CAFO that I refer to will be a 5,000 cow dairy operation, producing the amount of waste of a community of 125,000 people. The high risk of this dairy waste entering the mentioned 10 Mile Creek is dangerous and could potentially bring to a halt all the progress that has been made to improve the water quality of Pete Mall and Castle Rock, the second and fifth largest lakes in the state, which provide uh, at recreational opportunities to thousands of families per year. To reach the EPA water quality standard in Castle Rock and Petenwell, a reduction of phosphorus needs to occur at the mouth of Ten Mile Creek instead of adding very high risk of increasing its phosphorus content. To move forward with this proposed dairy operation is to ignore all that we know about improving water quality. It ignores the tax dollars already invested in the TMDL. In short, it is a case where our focus of meeting water quality standards as set forth by the EPA will be ignored. Thank you. Nicole Barless, next up, Mary Kenosian. <coughs> Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Nicole Barless, and I work for the Dairy Business Association, representing dairy farmers and their families across the state of Wisconsin. As a dairy farmer myself, a mother of two small children, a former agriculture educator, and a past spokesperson for Wisconsin agriculture, I can assure you that our dairy farms work hard every single day to protect and conserve the land and water that our farms, cows, and our families depend on. We need to remember that our farmers are not bad people. We are not villains trying to pollute and hurt Wisconsin's beautiful landscape and communities. My family depends on clean drinking water, just like all of your families. After all, we want this beautiful resource to be available for years and years to come by our future generations. I want my kids to be able to farm and care for the land, just as my entire family has been afforded for decades. What you must know is that modern dairies across the state are critical to the well-being of our cherished Wisconsin rural communities. Farms of all sizes provide jobs. They keep rural businesses thriving, such as feed cooperatives, veterinarians, banks, hardware stores, and more. These farms help contribute to the tax base that is so vital in maintaining our local schools and roads. Our farms are not the villains. After years of encouraging farmers to spend millions of dollars to build vegetated treatment areas, or VTAs, on farms, 
The Wisconsin BNR is now pushing farmers to abandon the practice and start collecting vast quantities of rainwater from feed pads and calf hutch areas. The DNR claims that these changes came from the directive of EPA. In addition to having limited and incomplete research to prove that collection from these areas would have a positive effect on our environment, these changes would cost our farmers millions of dollars to build additional storage. Dollars they simply do not have. More importantly, what you are asking will have a negative impact in that farmers would, be, would have to spread additional liquid manure and wastewater on fields. We are already required to spread in such a short seasonal window that drastic increases in the volume of wastewater from these unnecessary areas would only increase the chances of runoff events and potentially make them more harmful. Our families, our dairy farm families, do not want a negative runoff event on our shoulders. I am a farmer. My dad is a farmer. My grandpa is a farmer. We must stop attacking people like me and others like my family who work so hard to make our Wisconsin community so great, produce a wholesome, fresh product, and care for our animals and land. Let's instead work together and collaborate on sustainability and new technologies that will make us even better. This is a proactive approach to improving what we do instead of adding nonsense regulations that will hinder the farms that make Wisconsin the great place that it is. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. I'm Mary Kanojan, and I come here from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Uh, and I'd like to say uh, our family uh, jointly owns a farm in southeast Wisconsin. And I have the highest respect for the farmers there and the care they take, but not all the farmers in the neighborhood do. You know, I had manure dropped all over the road so that uh, it gets all over the car, and not all farmers are careful. I, I think we need rules with verification. And right now, the verification is poor and the enforcement is worse. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, that you have moved here from Iowa partly because, well, we went on a canoe trip. There was a herd of cattle in the water, and that doesn't bother me. I've been around cattle. But by golly, a nice canoe trip with water full of cow pads. It's no good. It's not that my husband's a native of Wisconsin. <clears throat> we gotta get back here. And also, I swore when we moved back here 10 years ago, I will never go to another meeting again. <laughs> you can see that didn't come true. <laughs> Anyways. People here have spoken eloquently of a number of things I was going to say, uh, and I am really touched by the, the, what the people in Kewanee County are going through, and i like to affirm it and yeah, affirm everything said, put it that way. Uh, the only new thing I have to suggest here is that we expand the notion of stakeholders. Earlier speakers have spoken about dumping stuff into Lake Superior and the Great Lakes, uh, whatever it is, the compact with Canada and all. I have just come back from a, a citizen science building seminar in New Orleans, Louisiana, and been talking with some folks uh, in NGOs down there. Wisconsin has asked the EPA um, for a variance on uh, updating to the new phosphorus permits. And when I told some of the folks uh, down there in the Gulf Restoration Network, people that live, have their incomes destroyed because there's a dead zone about the size of the state of Connecticut, according to the NOAA stuff I read this summer, because of pollutants that wash downstreams from all states along the Mississippi River. 
I know this is the upper Mississippi watershed, but manure flows downhill uh, to the Gulf. Uh, and so we need to pay attention to the fact that this isn't just Wisconsin that's getting polluted. Lake Menomins is awful. Some of the cyanobacteria that's evident kill off, depending on the, vari uh, the variety, some of them will have severe neuro and liver toxins, and there's been linkages to uh, Lou Gehrig's disease from some Australian research. Anyways, this isn't just us. This is bigger than even Wisconsin. We need to I know the EPA has a hypoxia task force, I believe it is, for the Gulf. And believe me, everything we do here affects that. Uh, to my surprise, I was looking up on the American Farmland Trust, how much acreage in Wisconsin is devoted to this and that. And uh, I need to verify this, speaking of the need for verification, but they said there were more acres planted in corn in Wisconsin in any other state. Now I know the production isn't like Iowa and Illinois, um, but we have a huge amount of ant land and ag, and we need to see that it's used in a responsible way. I mean, I, farming is wonderful. It's a great way of life, but well, uh, but we have a responsibility for clean water. And we have a responsibility to everybody that's downstream, whether it's in the Great Lakes or New Orleans. Thank you. I'm Catherine Stahl, and I live in Dunn County, which is a uh, county just adjacent to where you're sitting right now. And thank you for coming to the listening session. You've probably heard the mantra that Wisconsin is open for business. Let's look at some of the ramifications of that singular focus. In 2014, there was a major discharge from a Chippewa County sand mine, which left two trout streams, creamy white with colloidal clay, for a few weeks. Due to community outrage, the, com the company did build new, larger stormwater ponds. Wisconsin DNR indicated that there was nothing illegal about the discharge. And in Dunn County, based on current regulations, Wisconsin DNR recommended approval for an expansion to 5,000 cows for a CAFO that already had existing violations for overspreading. You heard Rachel Cooper talk about that one. Uh, had the local farmers not testified at the listening session, DNR would not have known of the lack of authorization by neighboring animal for them to spread on their land. So you've already heard about that. In Dunn County, a retired USGS hydrologist found 150 sites where human septage is being spread on land that does not mean meet the NR113 percolation standards. Human waste spread on soils with percolating rates as high as 10 to 20 inches per hour speaks to imminent danger to our groundwater that we citizens depend on for our drinking and our animals. Wisconsin DNR does not have adequate staff to monitor septic spreading. In the southeast corner of Dunn County, one of three wells out of several hundred wells that have been tested had above acceptable levels of nitrates. Given the sandy soils and intensive farming done with recently wildly expanded irrigation and high capacity wells, we have a ready formula for more nitrate and egg chemicals in our water. As you may know, Wisconsin DNR has been subject to the controversy about their right to consider accumulative impacts of multiple high capacity wells. Just north of Menominee in Dunn County are two lakes that are poster children for cyanobacteria pollution created by excessive phosphorus. You've heard some references to that before. Again, Wisconsin DNR has not been a leader in dealing with this water crisis for this neighborhood. Uh, they, what's more, last year, as you heard, a new state uh, statute preempted local, uh, local regulations that would have helped correct that problem. In 2013, 28 exploratory boreholes were dug for a sand mine in Chippewa County. 
They were not appropriately filled, and in some cases the, field, the fields where they were dug were spread with manure. Obviously, this opens the possibility of contaminating our groundwater. And let me point out that Wisconsin DNR has no way of knowing about boreholes until they learn about their existence from written reports after the fact that would indicate that they've been filled appropriately. The company did not submit such a report. Were it not for citizens, Wisconsin De in Department of Natural Resources would not have known about this infraction. In Chippewa County, a CAFO with gullies several feet deep and one of its sloping sandy fields filled the gullies with 86 truckload piles of manure solids. After more rains, those gullies were again empty. The runoff from the fields leads to an adjacent wetland. No corrective action was taken. These are examples of problems from two of 72 counties in Wisconsin. We recognize that it's a big task to investigate the various ways that our waters can be and are being endangered. Wisconsin DNR and our county land and water conservation staff have competent and conscientious field staff. However, their impacts are limited due to either being understaffed, experiencing limited funding, and or having much reduced support from Wisconsin's political leadership to hold accountable those specific individuals and those specific companies who are not good stewards of our waters. Yes, we're open for business. And just as importantly, we want to be the land of clean waters and drinkable groundwater. We need balance. We need balance. That's not coming from our state government. And my fear is what's going to happen with EPA, uh, that you may have some, the same dilemma. dilemma. As citizens, we can't adequately address all of the previously mentioned concerns alone. We really need your help. I'm Jenny Gruber. I live near the CAFO in Dunn County that has asked for an expansion from roughly 1,200 animal units to over 7,000. And they live near a creek, Cranberry Creek. I'm about seven miles from this place and I am new to this whole effort on protecting the groundwater. But I am aware of the pollutants from pesticides, herbicides, etc., because I raise honeybees. Anybody who knows me knows I raise honeybees. So I'm aware of all the runoff problems, and if water isn't clean for the honeybees, they can't live either. I am concerned about our groundwater, our surface water, and the expansion that is undergoing throughout our state. It's overwhelming. Can there be a way to figure out what is the maximum number of animal units we can support in our beautiful dairy country without having 7,000 in one place? The, the traffic on my road during spreading of manure and hauling <coughs> of silage is a lot. Our country roads, can we take this overabundant use of these heavy trucks hauling things? When I was at the DNR hearing that they held at our town hall in Rock Falls, what struck me most was they were looking at the water impacts. I call it a stovepipe analysis. They didn't look at the other impacts on the community, on property values, on the air, and it was like, there is no, I worked in government a long time. We could not do anything without analyzing the impacts throughout the whole area of whatever it was we were going to do. And here we are, DNR looks at just the water. I was, I tell you, shocked. And then I hear their staff is depleted. They can't do inspections. Inspections are done. There's no penalties. The CAFO application is continuing to going forward. It's like, how do we stop this? DEET was not outlawed 
until it was 40 years of use. This glyphosate issue, I really applaud the lady who summarized all of that. We have our monocultures because the farmers want to raise more. And I grew up on a farm. I love farmers. But at some point, we have to have a respect for the land we're using, our neighbors, the air, our future, without respect for each other and what we're doing so that we do it correctly, properly, with common sense. We're going to ruin our lives. We're going to ruin the earth for anybody coming after us. It boils down to respect. But one of the gentlemen speaking on the guidelines that cables have to follow referred to the nutrient management plan, new term to me, as a book thick. Who's going to read a book thick nutrient management plan and know what's all in it? People are hired to haul the manure out, and some of the fields are supposed to be, you can't, you can't spread any manure on this like corner of the field or this whatever. Who in driving these trucks, and I've seen them, they are filthy, really filthy, and it smells. And are they going to know they cannot spread within 100 feet of this tree line or these shrubs or whatever? They're going to spread wherever it's open. I, I am really mind boggled by a lot of the complexities in all of this. And I know people try their best, but somehow we have to get a rein on the explosion of massive numbers of animals in one location. I appreciate your coming to hear us. You can tell that we're all really worried about our groundwater, surface water. And that's not just for the bees, it's for all of us. Thank you for listening to us. It really means a lot. Um, today, in I'm, I'm from Hudson, Wisconsin, by the way, about as far west as you can get. Um, and today, our St. Croix County and our whole lot of areas of our state, our clean water is threatened. And it seems to be there's a lot of threats from factory farms, otherwise known as cables. And our Wisconsin DNR is not protecting us. Our state governor has eviscerated it. The Legislative Auto Bureau report, as people have mentioned, they failed to send violation notices in 94% of the nearly 560 violations. I'm not a farmer, um, but I will tell you, I grew up in an area, I'm not from, did not originate from here. I grew up in an area downwind and downwater from Gary, Indiana, and all the steel mills. Mm -hmm. So I know what pollution is like. Where I grew up, you didn't swim in the lakes, you didn't fish in the streams, you didn't touch the water. If you fell in as a kid, you thought you were going to die. Maybe you would. But when I moved here, it was amazing and fantastic. And I will do everything in my power to try to protect this, because I don't take it for granted. And I love this state. And so when I found out that there was going to be an ex proposed expansion of the Emerald Dairy um, in Emerald, Wisconsin, they wanted to add 8,000 more, 8,804 animals, and it already has 2,460. And this is an out-of-state owner, which I'm coming to find out uh, happens more and more often. So anyway, when I found this out, I realized you know this is going to be a threat. So I attended the Midwest Factory Farm Summit with another uh, person who was a retired dairy farmer. And this was sponsored by Mary Doherty, who spoke here, and some other people. So I could learn about factory farms. And I learned a lot. One of the shocking things I learned is that the Clean Water Act um, does not deal with surface water. I mean, it deals with surface water, but not groundwater. And that most of the factory farms are self-regulated. Mm -hmm. You know, foxes guarding the hen house. And I also learned that with that number of animal units, 8,800 animal units, we produce millions of gallons of animal waste 
equal to about 1.4 million people. And this waste does not go through a municipal water treatment plant. It's also very worrisome because within two miles of this cable, the wells have tested with unsafe levels of nitrates and bacteria. When people are saying they're above the limit, they're unsafe. This means you can't use it. It's not just like above the accepted level. This means you can't wipe your grandson's skinned knee off with the water. And several cables in, in Kewanee County, as people have mentioned, like a third of them of the wells have been contaminated. So besides threatening our drinking water, runoff from cables pollute rivers, lakes, trout streams. In most of St. Croix County, we have the underground karst formation, another thing I've learned about, which is a very porous rock formation. And it would allow the groundwater to flow all the way to the St. Croix River, which is part of the national park system. I love the St. Croix River. I don't own property on it. I don't own a boat. But it is beautiful and spectacular. It's a national park. You know, tourism in Wisconsin has added $19.3 billion to our economy in 2015. This is directly related to our pristine waters of fishing and recreation. Contamination of these waters can and does happen from runoffs or leak, leaks from liquid manure that's held in lagoons and cables. And what about the effect of following our water on our property values? And, you know, we're not talking, most of us are not talking about family farms. The family farms are mostly very good stewards. They have to make a living. These some of these factory farms are actually undercutting their whole way of life. And after one of all the things I learned about cables, one of the things I came away with is that it seems like there's no good reason for them except to enrich the owners at the expense of everyone and everybody else, everything else. When you take into account all the true costs, you can't even justify that they're providing a lot of food because it's not a sustainable in industry. All citizens have a right to clean, safe, and unabundant water per our public trust document that's enshrined in the Wisconsin State Constitution. So I hope the EPA will use your oversight and enforcement to help ensure that this stays that way. Thank you. Uh, good evening and thank you for attending. Uh, I showed a short video. Some of you have seen it already. It's my video, 30 second video called Paddle Soup. And it shows uh, uh, blue green algae that is four to five inches thick off the end of my pier just three years ago. I uh, was able to show that to uh, uh, Chris uh, at the break. Um, and I'd be glad to send that on to the EPA if they'd like to see it. But uh, as he said, he's seen a lot of uh, the similar blue-green algae across the states. I'm here because this is a personal impact. Uh, moved down to this lake eight years ago. Uh, my son has some health problems. He was told by a surgeon, Madison, don't go in the water. Again, this is Tater Monoman, the most impaired waters in the state. And the surgeon said, by the way, don't let your children go in the water either. So here's my grandchildren. Can't go in the water. You know, besides the drinking water, now my well, my personal private well, is polluted nitrates. Tested years ago, above the limits. It's now at 14.8. Four neighbors tested it. They're all above the levels. We have no recourse. After years of working on this, there's no way to get factual data on health impacts. I've requested it, I've gone after it, I've tried to get people to study it, I've gone after money trying to get people to study it and give us the data because of HIPAA laws, etc. No, you can't get it, you can't bring it up. So if you can do anything, try and educate the public on what health impacts are happening because of that pollution that's out in front of me every day. Somebody said the number of impaired waters, uh, I went back and looked at a six year period, the most recent six year period, and it averages 185 new impaired waters every year in Wisconsin, and only 13 taken off that list. I just want to summarize to say we've been abandoned. 
I don't have someone that I can talk to <coughs> that I know will be able to help us make this change. We have gone out and worked in the community and working on every way possible to find <coughs> collaboration with all aspects. We did a strategic plan. We said the root cause is phosphorus coming into our waters. Okay? So we don't discriminate. We don't say this area or that area has more to do with the problem. We just ask, can everyone take a piece of it? Can you solve that issue? Okay. That's good, but it's going to be more than my lifetime that I finally believe is going to be able to see that. But the problem was caused 40 years ago. They didn't have blue-green algae in our bodies of water 40 years ago. It has changed. So something has changed. And we need you to do the jobs you love, but we need some enforcement. This state has abandoned enforcement. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this listening session. My name is Stephanie Dreyer. I'm a lifelong resident of Wisconsin, currently residing in St. Clair, St. Clair County. It's clear from what I've heard today and what my research has told me that Wisconsin is open for business and that our natural resources are definitely for sale. Wisconsin statute appears more stringent than federal requirements for effluent limits and protections for both ground and surface waters. However, in recent years, the Department of Natural Resources has taken an unreasonably limited view of its authority, it's understaffed, and it has adopted policies and procedures that have undermined the federal requirements that overall enforcement of the pollution discharge elimination system. My concerns will center around the department's review, issuance, and enforcement of CAFOs. Fines for polluters in Wisconsin dropped 78% in one year, according to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in May 2016. The DNR consistently fails to conduct environmental impact statements for each large dairy operation or their expansions by way of issuance of a blanket general WPD, WPDS permit. Revisions to statute were adopted on the advantage of a streamlined process, which then allows for the DNR to conduct site visits and compliance efforts. I think we all know in this room that the DNR does not perform these compliance efforts or maintain enforcement metrics that meet the spirit and intent of the generally issued WPDS permit. Secondly, lawmakers have cut the agency's funding, which has limited the staff available for permit review and for compliance and enforcement activities. As a result, the DNR approves fraudulent applications, reissues a permit to applicants with substantial non-compliance, relies on self-regulated parties to report non-compliance and fails to follow up on complaints, the DNR does not use its enforcement authority to deny these applications. Rather, it expands permits and they're placed on hold and allows the existing source CAFOs to continue to operate under less stringent permit requirements with minimal threats of enforcement and penalties. Commonly, permits are reissued to operations that are not in substantial compliance with their current W. PDS permit and already negatively are impacting our waters. Third, the department is placing our groundwater at additional risk by allowing variances to well setbacks and allowing waste and manure transfer lines to go inside the very lines that the state has defined as setbacks. This increases our risk for exposure to contaminants like cryptosporidium, giardia, nitrates, and other chemicals. Fourthly, the DNR has not adopted critical elements of the National Environmental Laboratory Standard to ensure ethics and data integrity are applied to laboratories used for these nutrient, nutrient management plans. The nutrient management plan specialist who reviews and approves the CAFO nutrients and the items that they have to review, like pH, phosphorus, potassium, and the organic matter, they're often co-located in the very certified lab that is used for processing sample results and oftentimes have access to sample logging and sample receipt information. The state needs to adopt data and 